before I introduce John, I want to thank Terry <coughs> for introducing our children here to a relic they've probably never seen, an overhead projector. <laughs> an old overhead projector. Terry, you've been better off to uh, borrow that book and spend $119 taking class learning how to use PowerPoints or something. <laughs> <laughs> I have the honor of uh, introducing our next speaker, John West. Um, uh, John, as you know, uh, is married to Sonia, who is the church secretary. And uh, of course, uh, I know all our members know the, the rest of the, uh, the West family, uh, uh, Lauren and Jonathan and Joshua. But let me just say right up front before I get to John, that what a blessing to have him and his family, and especially Sonia as our church secretary. They are, mean much, so much, I know, to uh, David and myself and Ken and Buddy. So, but John was born in Aberdeen, Mississippi. His uh, father, brother, and father-in-law are all gospel preachers. Uh, he's preached full-time in Mississippi and Alabama. He's conducted gospel meetings in uh, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan, Across the Mason Dixon line, uh, Mississippi, yeah, <laughs> Mississippi, Texas, uh, and Tennessee. He's uh, participated in mission trips, uh, mission trips to the island of uh, Grenada and uh, to England, or Grenada, depending on where you're from. <coughs> he uh, probably doesn't brag about this as much as he used to, but uh, he's a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching, and uh, able to see right through that era. So. Uh, we appreciate him so much in that. Has a BA in Bible from Freed Hardeman, Masters in Ministry, and is uh, currently enrolled in Houston Community College Police Academy. And uh, I think takes uh, finishes that up next week, if I remember correctly. He is uh, an instructor and in the academic dean for the Tr Truth Bible Institute and currently preaches for the Dayton Church of Christ in Dayton, Texas. And uh, he's He's a good man, and I can't say I can't say anything more than that. That he's a faithful man with a faithful wife, and and uh, has wonderful children. If you've ever met him, so I appreciate that so much. John coming uh, is going to be doing a review of the book by Joe Bean, Seeing the Unseen. I got a contradiction right in the title there already, so ought to be fun. John, come and speak to us. My family and I have been privileged to be here for almost four years now. And I believe if I were to decide to move tomorrow, most of everybody would be all right with it as long as I left Sonia behind. <laughs> <laughs> and she said if I decided to move tomorrow, she's staying here anyway. <laughs> I can move wherever I want it. She's just not going with me. It is a privilege to be here with you today, and I do appreciate this opportunity. There was one statement, though, uh, I need to correct about Jack. Uh, he said that Terry needs to start using PowerPoint. He is using PowerPoint. It's Cro-Magnum PowerPoint, <laughs> albeit a form of PowerPoint. <laughs> one of these days, Terry, maybe you'll learn real PowerPoint. You know, it's hard to follow somebody like Terry, but one thing for sure, uh, it was mentioned I've been to Michigan. I've held several gospel meetings in Michigan. And I've never even met a Yankee yet that can either out-talk Terry or talk as fast as Terry. And they talk about how slow Southerners speak. They haven't met Terry yet. And if they have, then he's put them all to shame. But anyway, I'll be reviewing the book by Joe Beam, Seeing the Unseen. This book was written in 1994 by Joe Beam, or published actually in 1994. And it, wasn't short, it was shortly after this book came out that I uh, was at a preacher's meeting, and apparently the preacher that was conducting the meeting had bought the book and read it and was so upset at what was written in it that this, uh, this book was reviewed at one of our preacher's meetings. We did, did not do very many book reviews at our preacher's meetings. We discussed various things, usually had a speaker and things like that, but at this particular preacher's meeting, he reviewed it because the book upset him so much. I remembered very little from what, what he said because we didn't have... <coughs> A long time to go through this, but he gave a brief, a brief overview of it. I did sit down and read this book. I know last year there was someone who came to the open forum and made the false charge that a lot of the speakers did not read their books and they were up bashing the men and they were not dealing with the subject because they didn't know the subject since they did not read it. I can say that I have read this book more than once. I read it through entirely one time. I've gone back through an excerpt that I highlighted in uh, things that I went back over trying to decide what to put in, in the manuscript and what not. 
I could have written, I think, the entire lectureship book had I been given enough space and enough time to do so based on the things that Joe Beam put in this book. So what you have in the lectureship book, 20-something pages, uh, is really still only a brief overview of it. I will say this, that this chapter and this lecture is not a personal attack. That was also an accusation last year made by someone, and I think maybe others even on the Internet, but someone who came to the open forum. This is not a personal attack against Joe Bean. This is an attack of his false doctrine. And there needs to be the uh, distinguishing uh, aspect made of that because I am here to review or expose this book as the kind of book it really is. Although I will be dealing at times very strongly, and other speakers will be this week as well, with the authors of these various books. They will be to deal with the subject content, although things will be said about these men and, and the way they've conducted themselves or some of the doctrines they teach, this is in no way personal attacks against them. This is dealing with their perversion and their false doctrine. So all of you watching on the internet who have the preconceived ideas, get that out of your head because we will be dealing with the content of the book. The Apostle John wrote in John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The judgment that will be given today and throughout this week will be righteous judgment based upon their errors or the errors in the books that will be reviewed. Jesus stated in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 20, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And we shall see the fruits in this particular lecture of Joe Beam and his doctrine and the things he taught not only in this book. I will give some background information as well, some other aspects about him. As we examine the fruits of Joe Beam and his teaching, We'll see that he has erred not only in, in the teaching of this book, but in various other aspects in his life as well. Before getting into the content of seeing the unseen, I do want to spend a, some time dealing with a very brief background of some things uh, related to Joe Beam and his speaking, where he's spoken, those with whom he associates. We'll mention that just very briefly. But looking into this background, it's definitely not extensive because we just simply do not have the time to get an extensive background study of him I could also spend this entire lecture just going through background of what he has done, where he's been, and where he even stands now. We'll only briefly mention those. He has been a false teacher for many years and has been known as a false teacher. When I went through the Memphis School of Preaching back in the mid to late 1980s, Joe Beam was known then. I heard of Joe Beam's name first after I enrolled in the Memphis School of Preaching. And at that time, they stood against him. I think they probably still stand against him now, although not as strongly uh, with some speakers as they have in the past. But when I was in school there, we learned about some of Joe Beam's false doctrines. It was shortly after graduating there and entering into Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama, where I heard more of his false doctrines, especially since his brother-in-law was and continues to be the president of Faulkner University. And we heard very uh, often very many things about his doctrine then. Joe Beam has spoken and continues to speak on lectureship, such as, such as the Tulsa Soul Winning Workshop, uh, all you have to do is mention the name. You know where that stands if, if you're familiar with uh, lectureships within the Church of Christ. Tulsa has been the uh, advocate of false doctrine for well over 25, 30 years and possibly longer than that. I remember and have tapes from back in the mid-80s from Tulsa of uh, some of the false doctrine taught on that, that workshop. The now defunct uh, program in Nashville, Tennessee, the National Jubilee, he spoke on that. He's associated himself for many, many years with the likes of Rubel Shelley, with the likes of Max Licato, Mike uh, Cope, uh, Randy Harris, and others of this ilk. As a matter of fact, after submitting the manuscript, I received this in the mail. This is the 2011 lectureship schedule for the Pepperdine Lectures in Malibu, California, that will be conducted May the 3rd through the 6th. When you take a look in the, toward the back, it has about 13 or 14 pages of their lectureship speakers with their pictures of where they're from or where they're living currently. Joe Beam is listed on that. You go to the very back of their lectureship schedule and look at the list of all the speakers of the books reviewed this week. Eight books that will be reviewed are going to be of those men who will be speaking on the 2011 Pepperdine Lecture. Those who are familiar with Pepperdine, have a very good understanding of where they stand, or I should say where they do not stand anymore. So this gives some insight about Joe and uh, where, he do, where he has been and what he does now. But even further insights could be found upon perusing the Internet. Joe has claimed for many years to believe in, in quote, non-denominational, end quote, Christianity. 
And that's a statement he has made. He believes in non-denominational first century Christianity. However, where he speaks and whom he fellowships uh, proves otherwise. On November 29th at 12.30 p.m., he posted the following quote on his Facebook page. And this is an exact quote. Spoke for the Midland Valley Church of the Nazarene yesterday. What a great church. Really like their new pastor as well as the staff that I have known for a while. Great people, great hearts. And if you're in the Augusta, Georgia, Aiken, South Carolina area, check them out. And he gives their website. It so happens that November the 29th was on a Monday. He was with them, he said, yesterday, which November the 28th was on a Sunday. So rather than worshiping with the saints, as he should have been, he was at the Church of the Nazarene giving one of his seminars. But he goes further. On his Facebook page, dated November the 20th, posted at 11, 11 a.m. on his wall, he states this. Visited the Full Life Assembly of God in Franklin, Tennessee yesterday. Pastor Nick Serban and his beautiful wife, Kim, are wonderful people. So if that doesn't give you a background into Joe and where he goes and those with whom he fellowships, uh, nothing will. If you look on the Family Dynamics website that he started, it is my understanding now, I don't know how long this has been the case, but he is no longer actively involved with Family Dynamics. He's moved on, he's started a new website, he's got new things he's doing, different types of seminars he's doing, although he still does some marriage seminars, uh, and he still is actively involved with Family Dynamics to an extent, I guess you would say. But on the Family Dynamics website that he started, or the company he started, they list that they conduct seminars with the Churches of Christ and, and they list 18 denominations with whom they fellowship and work with their seminars. Now, I have no problem with going to denominational church and speaking as long as I can speak freely about the gospel of Jesus Christ and giving a defense of the gospel, but going and telling everyone how to have a happy marriage, hugging necks and shaking hands as if everything is okay and we're in full fellowship with them, I will not do. Yet this is something that Beam has done for many, many years. And we need to understand that also from the outset. Now let's get into the book and look at a, an expose of seeing the unseen. Is his book balanced? Or if you've read the book, would you say it's sensational? Now, we're going to notice what he states about it. Joe Beam declares in the introduction of his book that he believes on page 3, quote, that beings roam the earth today, end quote. You might ask, what kind of beings roam the earth today? Well, he goes on and explains this a little bit later. But he states in his book that he declares that he has written a book from a, quote, balanced middle-of-the-road view, end quote, page 3. He also states, I shy away from sensationalists who see a demon in every corner, end quote, also on page 3. Now, seeing the unseen, who are the unseen? As we expose this book, you will notice the unseen are angels, both good and bad, and demons and devils that are in this world today, along with the Holy Spirit who leads and guides him in going places and doing certain things. We'll talk about it if we have time. If not, you'll just have to read the book. By the way, there is absolutely no way that I can cover all the material even in the book in this lecture. So you just need to get the book and read it. If I could talk as fast as Terry and I could absorb oxygen through my skin rather than having to breathe and stop for, for breath momentarily, I might could cover it all, but that would even be a stretch. Also, if Terry had been, you're smart, David, putting him first, and he'd been the last speaker, we'd go to seven because since there'd be no more speakers after him, he'd think he had the seven to speak tonight. That wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't be anything unusual with Terry. Everybody likes to pick on Terry. I had to take my shot there, too. But anyway, we can't cover it all. So we'll cover what we can. Pick the book up and read the rest. That's all I can say. He goes on on page 10. And he says, now, now notice page 3. He said that he shies away from sensationalists who see demons in every corner. But notice a quote on page 10. Quote, I now find myself looking for the unseen in almost every situation I encounter. Is that almost, it really is the same thing, but lest he come back and say, you took me out of context, let's say almost the same thing that he said. He changed the words by saying he shies away from those who see a demon in every corner. He may not see a demon in every corner, but he's looking for one in every situation, and that's what he states himself on page 10. Look at the contradiction already in the book. You can actually read contradictions in his introduction to the book and in his preface and then in the first chapter. But as we get into that, page 10, he's already contradicted himself very glaringly by stating, already stating, 
I don't do like these sensationalists and see these demons everywhere. But I, I'm looking for them in, there, in every situation I find, in every place I go. He's always looking. He thinks they're there. It's interesting when you read the book, uh, some of the wild statements like that that are made, and they get even worse. Throughout the book, he describes what he terms, quote, a spiritual warfare that Christians are fighting. Now, if we talk about a spiritual warfare, we would think that as Christians, we are in a war with Satan, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. We are fighting a spiritual battle with Satan. And as we fight that spiritual battle, we're trying to overcome the temptations of this life that Satan puts in front of us. That's what the normal Christian would think. However, Joe Beam in his book will write that those with whom he encounters are not just temptations that come our way, although he talks about the temptations and does a very good job on some of those areas. He also says that we've got these angels, evil, bad angels, plus the demons that are trying to get you. And they're literally here, and you don't see them, but they may get you. So you better watch out. So this is the kind of book that he says is a balanced, middle-of-the-road kind of book. Uh, I think of poltergeist and exorcism things, uh, the omen. When I read this book, that's what popped in my mind from what he was saying. Although he says he does not go to those sensational movies and he does not, or does not believe in those type of sensational movies as a basis of his book. But when he writes it, that's exactly what comes across. Terry had a lot about inference and implication in his lecture just a few minutes ago. There are a lot of implications in this book that would lead one to think about movies such as uh, Poltergeist or The Omen or things like that when you actually go through this book. Now, Beam does make a sensational approach, whether he says that or admits it or not, because he believes that literal angels, albeit some evil ones, are, have been trying to hurt him. Now, he has a part in the book. I didn't even include this in this lecture. You'll have to read the uh, manuscript for that. But he has a section that he says that because God, through his Holy Spirit, has led him and guided him into being able to reach other people and, and being able to see and understand things that are going on within this world with the unseen angels, evil angels, and demons around him, that they can't hurt him because he's got the power of the Holy Spirit keeping him from being hurt. However, he does say in another section that he saw a man when he was pre presenting a seminar staring at him with a very uh, stern, evil look on his face. And he thought he was one of these evil angels or maybe some demon come to get him. So as the lecture ended, he stepped down from the podium and went to his wife and said, you and the kids stay here, don't go to the back because I'm going to be attacked when this is over. There's a demon in the audience that's going to attack me. He had already said because of the power of the Holy Spirit, he couldn't be hurt. Then he tells his wife and kids, don't come back to the back because I'm going to be attacked by a demon. And then when it didn't happen, then he thought it was the power of the Holy Spirit that kept that demon from actually getting him. That's the kind of idea this man has. Kooky? Yes, I say these ideas are very kooky. Are they biblical? Absolutely not. And we're going to notice these as we go through. Again, just because I said his ideas are kooky, and he is a little kooky himself in what he believes, that's not a personal attack about the man. That just states what he is and states this is the kind of writing the man has put out. He doesn't want people to critique his writing. I'll not write things like this. And that's tr true with all these other writers as well. But he believes he was victorious from all these evil angels and demons uh, that have tried to hurt him because he learned his victory after studying these, quote, unseen angels and demons that were somewhere in the, quote, spiritual realm trying to get him. He also writes on page 10, quote, By his marvelous grace, God presently uses me to help many people see the unseen, finding his deliverance before the evil ones destroy them. Until now, he has done that by having me invited to conduct weekend seminars on spiritual warfare across the United States and Canada. There's so much evil to be battled that this book is the next step in God using me. He believes literally that God, in some special way, is using him to fight all of these demons and devils in the world. I wonder if he's the spiritual devil detective. That's one well, first thing that popped in my mind when I read that. Literally, and I wrote that in the margin of my book. Joe must be the spiritual devil detector. Because that's the first thing I thought of when I read that statement. He thinks God has him looking out for all these people and detecting demons in all these corners and finding all of them so he can put a stop to these evil spirits that are hurting people in this world today. Just think of how wild and sensational that is. Yet he says he avoids the sensational viewpoint of angels and demons. His wild ideas even go further. He states this in his book. Why are you reading this book? He asked. 
after giving several standard answers of why people would buy his book and read it, he offers, quote, another possibility for why people read the book. He says this, and I quote, The forces of God led you to read this book. That sounds rather melodramatic, but it's not just an idle thought. Having spent years traveling across America speaking to millions of people, I have come to realize that I am often put in just the right place at just the right time to say just the right words to just the right audience containing just the right person changing a life in a way too dramatic to explain. Now you think about that wild statement and tell me he wrote from a balanced middle of the road position. Here's a man that said God through his marvelous grace is using him to detect all these demons and, and put a stop to all these demons. And he said the reason some of you dear readers are reading my book because God led you to read it. So now does he believe that God miraculously is leading people to buy his book? Well, I know that sales was a lot of people. That probably helped his pocketbook a little bit more when he sold more of them. By the way, I found mine on Amazon used. I wouldn't go to a bookstore and pay the full price for it. I think I found it for $2 on Amazon. It wouldn't have been that, uh, if it had been any more, I probably would have just uh, had a decline in invitation day. <laughs> no, I'd have paid a little bit more for it, but not much more. But people are going to bookstores every day and buying this book and thinking it's the most wonderful thing. If you read some of the accolades uh, in this book of what others have said, and get on the internet and read. I've typed in Joe Beam, Seen the Unseen Book Review. You read some of the wild, landish comments that people make about how Joe changed their life. He's just such a great spiritual person, and if it weren't for him, they wouldn't have been able to find all the demons and devils in this world that they now can see. Again, I guess they're like Joe looking for them in every corner. Whether they see them in every corner or not, they're looking for them to see where they are. Now, how would Joe, Joe believe that God would lead people to read his book or even go as far to hear him speak? And he also believes that. Joe does believe that God, through his spirit, leads him to people and leads him to places. On page 16 of his book, he says this, It happened enough that when I arrive in a city to speak, I often ask God whom he sent me there for. God, are you going to tell me who you sent me there for? I know you're going to give me the answer before long. That's what he's saying here. He goes on and says, I have become so bold that sometimes I tell the audience, quote, I don't know why God sent me here, but someone here does or soon will. God's going to lay it on your heart to tell either me or tell you why I'm here. And I'm going to be here to help you fight your demons. That's what he's saying. God's going to miraculously lay it on his heart. Hell, he won't use the word miraculous. He'd say if, if he were here today that I'm taking him out of context. But when you read his book, that's exactly what the man believes in what he's saying. He does believe in a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. The latter part of the chapter that I, I wrote uh, deals with that. I don't know if we'll have time to deal with that or not. Probably not. But then Joe goes on in another chapter to describe a story by his youth minister about someone that the youth minister met. He, re he relates this story in his book. And I, I entitled that section, An Angel or a Hippie? He describes the youth minister coming into his office, pale as a ghost, sitting down almost speechless, not knowing what to say. And he said, Joe, you remember yesterday when we had some, some storms come through the area, apparently flooded some things in the area. And he said, uh, I decided to take my wife and kids home early. He wanted to drive them home rather than let his wife drive home herself because the roads were flooded. He went through a road I think it was called the Green River Road or something like that. That was flooded. He said about two feet of water going across the road. And he and his family driving down this road. And he saw a man standing knee deep in water next to a stalled car. The man with a disabled look, uh, appearing to be a throwback from a 60s hippie, standing by the car flagging him down. He said his uh, first senses told him not to stop because this man looked too bad. He's, of course, a 60s hippie. He could be a mass murderer or something, although he didn't put that in the book. He was afraid for his family and and implies the man could have been someone who had hurt his family. He said, but duty bound as a Christian, he had to stop. He picked the man up, asked, where to? And the man said, wherever you're going. He said he began to pray as they drove down the road because he was scared to death for him and his family. The man kept looking around at his family, looking at the things, the contents of the vehicle, not knowing what this man would do or where he would kill him, him and his family. He said they came out of the, the rain-swollen road uh, into an area where there were nothing but cornfields around. And the man said, stop. He said he began praying harder, saying, oh, God, please don't let them hurt my family. Uh, don't let this, this man do harm to us right now. Please stop him from hurting us. He said the man just got out of the car and shut the door. He said as he drove off, he was very relieved that the man didn't hurt him and his family. He looked in the rearview mirror, and the man had disappeared. Magically, he was gone. He disappeared. 
The next morning, he said, he woke up, went out into the driveway to get into his car. And I'm going to read you a quote from this. He said he got, went to the read, uh, get out in the car, and he, he found a note with a passage of scripture on the windshield that said this. And I'm quoting exactly as it is in the book, and they use the NIV, so this is a quote from the NIV. Quote, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have entertained angels without knowing it. End quote, Hebrews 13, 2, and it's on page 32 of Joe's book, To See in the Unseen. As the youth minister and Joe sat in his office after relating that account, visibly shaken as Joe describes him, the youth minister asked Joe, do you think? Joe responds, I don't know, but I believe it's possible. Dennis and Donna Randall, along with their three children, may have entertained an angel without realizing it. This good old 60s hippie was really an angel. Well, everybody's seen some of these angel shows. Um, well, I can't think of the, the show now. Is Touched by an angel. Thank you. My wife had to mouth that to me. Thank you. Because I couldn't remember. Touched by an angel. You remember there was one on there that had the long hair. He had a couple of them look like hippies. Some of them dressed up. Some of them had the white. Some of them didn't. Uh, touched by an angel. All these kind of movies have sensationalized the, the uh, subject and topic of angels for many, many years. And that's the kind of thing I thought of that show when I, when I read this. Oh, there's an angel. There was a hippie that jumped in the car and he didn't hurt him because he must have been a good angel. And he entertained that angel. And he thought that it was an angel that put that on his uh, windshield wiper. Although he doesn't come out and say for sure, as you see, Joe leaves the implication in the book that that's exactly who it was. It was an angel. Although he says, well, I don't know, but you know it could have been. He may have had an angel touch his life. And he did the Christian thing by giving this hippie angel a ride. Now, he doesn't call him a hippie angel. I do, but he describes him as a hippie. Now, you go further in the book on the next page. He calls this dentist back years later and asks for permission to use the story of this hippie angel in his book. And to make sure that he told it just as it happened so he'd give an accurate description of what Dennis told him. And after giving him permission, Dennis stated this. And this is on page 33 of Joe's book. Quote, you know how I keep everything, Joe. Well, I have searched for the card that was on my windshield, wanting to examine it again, to read the scripture once more, and to see if I could find a clue. Funny thing, it disappeared. Just one more mystery to add to the mystery. What happened to the card? He is methodical in keeping up or things orderly and arranged and knowing where everything is. But this particular piece of paper, out of all of his papers, just happened to disappear. You think old Dennis might have just misplaced his paper? Well, although he never comes out and states it, Beam leaves the implication, Terry, in his book that that angel magically made that disappear. He won't use the word magically, but describe it some other way accurately. But that angel magically made the paper disappear so he couldn't use that later on. Maybe as a shrine or something to brag about. Now, you figure it out yourself. But Joe leaves the implication that the angel took it. Just as the angel put it there mysteriously, mysteriously, the angel took it away so that Dennis couldn't use that again. Now, that gives you even more insight of the kind of book that I've been reading. It was enough to... Uh, make me kind of sick at times, literally. To have to read this and, and understand the type of false doctrine that is being uh, propagated among so-called brethren. This man, though, has been far off for many, many years. It doesn't surprise me. But to have this kind of false doctrine being taught and people in the church all over the place just falling head over heels for it, thinking it's just the best book ever written about angels and demons, now they can understand all about angels and demons, something they never understood before. Well, there are things that we can't understand about angels and demons. I just finished a five-week series at Dayton on angels because a question came up in Bible class about angels. And how do we know about angels? Do we know they are among us or do we know they may be among us and we're just not 100% sure? So we did a study on angels. The problem is maybe we don't study the subject enough and because of the wild sensational movies and television shows about them and the fascination with them, people come up with their own conclusions that are far from biblical. And that's exactly what Joe has done in his book. I think part of his problem, he's read too many books about angels and he's watched too much TV. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. But then we need to ask ourselves the question, was Satan a fallen angel or was he just an old serpent? Now that is a section or chapter that Joe has in his book. At one time he believed erroneously at that that God created Satan as an evil being. 
Although the Bible tells us he created everything good, Job one time believed that he created Satan evil. But he said that caused too many philosophical problems for him, so he had to abandon that theory. He denies, though, that Satan was a good angel cast down from heaven because of a sin he committed in heaven. He now believes that Satan was a good angel that was sent to earth to guard the tree of life. You read the book, that's what he states. That he believes that from his study of the Bible, that he is correct in believing that he was a good angel that God sent down to heaven to guard the tree of life and to keep them from eating of the tree of life. Well, go back to Genesis chapter 3. What does Genesis chapter 3 say about Satan? In verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? How does Moses describe Satan? Does he describe him as a good angel who is the guardian of the tree of life? Or the first account that we have of Satan, does he describe him as a serpent? Joe has him as an angel. God's inspired word has him as a serpent in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve both were tempted. Folks, when he tempted Eve to eat of that tree as is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, he is referred to as a serpent, not an angel. Where does Job come up with an understanding that this man, or that the Satan rather, was an angel, a good angel, that was in the garden as a good angel, and when he talked to Eve, he was a good angel, but then he fell. Did he fall right before he talked to Eve, thinking, I think I'm going to do something. And then he turned into serpent all of a sudden? Job doesn't explain all that. He leaves a lot unsaid and unstudied on his erroneous view. Job assumes that this fall was on earth, not from heaven, where he was cast down on earth. He says this on page 56. And since his existence began on earth, there is little likelihood that he could have been expelled from the mount of God to earth. Now notice that. It's a key statement because we're going to see a contradictory statement just in a moment. He said there is little likelihood that he could have been expelled from the mount of God, referring to heaven, to earth. Then he says, yes, it could be symbolic lang language, but the symbolism would be valid only if something happened in the garden that, this, that his language symbolizes. And what would that have been? So he said it, it's obvious that the only thing that could have happened to him is he fell on earth. He couldn't have fallen to earth from heaven or cast from heaven to earth. But notice Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now God's word says he was cast out into the earth. Job says that he was not cast out into the earth, but he was already in the earth when he became evil. He is good when he was sent down here. He is cast out into the earth after he's already in the earth, or on the earth. You see, the logic just doesn't make sense. But then he goes on and contradicts himself just in a moment. On his next page, on page 57 of his book, he states, Satan was cast from heaven as humankind fell from grace. Apparently, it was at this time, same time that rebellious angels followed Satan, forcing God to cast them to earth with him. He had already said it was little likelihood that he was cast from the mount of God to earth. Now he's stating he was cast from heaven to earth. Which is it, Joe? Make up your mind. If you're going to write a book and expect people to believe it, Joe, you need to be at least consistent in your own writings. And if Joe were standing here, or here, I would say the same thing to his face. And Joe, you may be watching this. I know some of the people who are being reviewed have watched some of the reviews of their books. And if you have, or you are watching, I would again say to you, please rethink your position. You're contradicting yourself too much. Yet, he doesn't look at his contradiction. He also attempts to answer Revelation 12, 9, and he contradicts himself even more by doing so. He states this, and this is on 79 of his book. This isn't a reference to the fall of the angels that took place at the beginning but is pictured as just a greater loss to Satan. It refers to the battle to destroy the baby Jesus and to Satan's failure to accomplish his mission. So now he's saying the fall of Satan and his angels did not come when he tempted Adam and Eve. He didn't fall, actually, until he had a hand in trying to murder the baby Jesus. Folks, that's several thousand years later. So which is it? He was already on earth. Then he tempted Eve, but he wasn't cast in the earth. But then he fell from heaven. But the fall from heaven couldn't have happened when he, or prior to him tempting Adam and Eve. The fall from heaven and the fall of his angels, which is just as a great a loss to him, had to happen in the uh, attempted murder of the Son of God. 
So now you see again more and more contradictions and wild ideas that is really standard throughout this book. Well, what about the, using a defense, the devil made me de do it? No old Flip Wilson made that po uh, popular years ago. The devil made me do it. Well, Joe apparently believes that as well. Joe tells a story of a man who had just been convicted of capital murder and the death of a state trooper. He shot about six times, I believe. And he said an evil spirit made him do it. Now, not Joe, but the man did. The man that was convicted of murder said an evil spirit made him do it. He couldn't help it. Uh, he had to kill that state trooper because the spirit told him to do that. Well, in the case of the convicted murder, murderer, Joe Beam says he doesn't think the devil made him do it. But here's something he does say, pages 63 and 64 of his book. It happens often enough that hardly anyone stops to ask whether an evil spirit really could have spurred the offender. After all, we're too sophisticated to believe the, quote, devil made me do it plea. Our law doesn't recognize such plea as valid. And anyone claiming such nonsense is either insane or trying to appear to be. Demon-driven people exist only in movies, right? Can the devil have that much power over a human being? Enough power to make him shoot another person six times? Now again, he just whets your appetite and then leaves you hanging for a second. But if you go to the next page, he doesn't believe that that evil spirit on page 65 uh, made him do it, but he says this, that doesn't mean an evil spirit was not involved. The words forced or made are too strong for what they do through their manipulation. Incited or prompted come directly from scriptures and accurately describe their activities. So it didn't make him do it, but he prompted him to do it. You know the very first thing I thought of when I read that statement? There's a lot of things came to my mind when I was reading this book. The very first thing I thought of, remember old TV shows? Well, you see the little devil pop up on his shoulder, it's about this tall, and he's saying, oh, go ahead now, do it, do it. You need to do that. You know you'll enjoy doing it. Oh, it'll be so funny if you do it. Then the little good angel pops up on the other side. Don't you do that. You know that wouldn't be right. You can't do that. That's exactly what I thought about when I read this because that's the impression that Joe leaves when he says, well, the devil didn't make him do it, but he had the little man on his shoulder tell him, go ahead, shoot him, shoot him. You need to shoot this man six times, I'd say. Go ahead and get him good. He didn't make him, but he influenced him. He prompted him. He's kind of coerced him into doing it. It's kind of thing that I think maybe he's been watching too much TV and coming up with some of these wild ideas. Yet again, remember, he said on page three that he wrote in a middle-of-the-road viewpoint. Well, Joe also believes in modern-day demon possession. He believes that demons are mentioned, that the demons that are mentioned in the Bible are, quote, the souls of the wicked dead who have come back to earth. They not only roam the earth, but they can inhabit and control the bodies of the living. Souls of the living dead. I remember watching a movie years ago. I, I think I was a teenager. Night of the Living Dead. You got all these zombies come back. They got all these video games now where you kill zombies. In our academy, we got a bunch of guys like to play these games online. And, and they come to school nearly every day talking about, oh, I killed so many zombies last night. Oh, we can't wait till the zombies hit the earth because now we know how to get them. You know, they're kind of joking when they say that. But when you start listening to books or reading books like Beam wrote, uh, I see why people really believe in the zombie wars and things going on. Because that's exactly what they have when they read books like this. And that's what comes to mind when you read Joe Beam's book. Uh, you have all these things. These, well, the wicked dead have come back and they're inhabiting the individual's body. They're possessing people's body. He actually does, by the way, believe in demon possession. Although that trooper that was shot, that wasn't pure demon possession. He does go on to state that it happens. Uh, for the source of proof, though, he says that this is what led him to believe in demon possession. Early pagan writers influenced him. Now, that really influenced me. Jewish writers of the time of Christ, because you read in the Bible about people that were possessed with demons. Uh, matter of fact, we find in Luke chapter 8 about the man in the tombs who was demonic. He asked Jesus, to, uh, the legion asked him to cast him out uh, into the swine. They ran violently off into the cliff and perished. So we read about those instances in the Bible. So Joe says, well, because that happened then, it's got to happen now. A lot of things happened in the first century or happened during Bible times that don't happen now. And just because I read about it in the Bible and I have faith that they happen that I can read doesn't mean I've got to believe that that's what is happening today. Yet he uses these as illustration to say this is why he believes in it. Uh, this, again, of course, was a miraculous event that occurred in Luke chapter 8, showing Jesus' power over the demons. Uh, other instances you find where the apostles were able to cast out demons themselves. 
uh, when they were sent on the limited commission, for instance, Matthew chapter 10, you find that happening as well. Doesn't mean that it happens today. But among his so-called proofs, he cites one of them that greatly influenced him. And remember I mentioned he watches too much television? He watched a television special entitled, quote, Angels Among Us. He was greatly influenced by one particular author, some reverend somebody. Uh, it's in the book. You can read it. Uh, but anyway, he was influenced by this man and all the great work he had done in exercising demons. But he said after watching the show, he sat in his recliner. He couldn't get it off his mind. It really troubled and bothered him. And he said this on page 103. For some time after the special, I sat thinking about the tremendous experience the Catholic Church has had with demons and exorcisms. So have many charismatic and Pentecostal churches. Discounting their experiences because of my doctrinal differences with them didn't show great wisdom on my part. I don't have to believe Catholic doctrine to believe uh, they have encountered satanic forces and faced them through the name of Jesus. Now just wrap that around your brain real quick in that statement. He goes on and says, I think it's time we look beyond the borders of our own religious heritage to see what our religious neighbors have learned that can be of value to us in this spiritual war. We're fighting demon-possessed people, so we need to know how to do it. So you want to learn how to do it? Let's go to Catholics, Pentecostals. They can teach us. And I think he's been sitting in front of his TV too long, and he's been going to the Nazarene and these holiness Pentecostal churches too long and fellowshipping them. Uh, this has rubbed off on him and he continues to believe it. But he does say in his next section of this chapter, in dealing with exorcism, since we mentioned that, he says on page 106, but what if it's too late for avoidance? What if the demon has already taken up residence? And he teaches pure demon possession. Well, first of all, we do not have the same power given to the apostles. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, Jesus, when he had called his unto him his 12 disciples. It says he gave them power against unclean spirits, spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. Doesn't mean we're given that same power, folks. There's not a single verse in the New Testament that authorizes Christians today to cast out demons, nor is there a verse that states that people are demon-possessed today. And yet you listen to what he says, then you say that, oh, they are here. And that's the problem, too many people listening to him. He goes on further and he says, If I were called to do an exorcism, I can assure you I'd go armed with a shield of faith and a bombardment of prayer. Demons aren't the spooks of fun houses and, the, and bad movies. They are creatures who can torment and destroy. Well, my advice to Joe is, Joe, since you're a, a, a novice at this, why don't you find your Catholic priest or Pentecostal preacher? They're the experts. Take them let them do it. You stand back and watch. Folks, and you start getting into reason and logic, if you're going to call somebody to do something, if that actually happened, would you want to call a novice like Joe? Or would Joe want to go along with some experts and let them do it and him watch as an apprentice? But he's ready to do it. He said he's never experienced it, but if he was, he was called upon to do it, he'd be ready. I wonder how long it'll be before he claims to actually do an exorcism. As far as he's going in this book, it wouldn't surprise me if he hasn't already claimed it. And maybe I just haven't because of my limited uh, response to him or with him. Uh, I mean, I've seen that. Well, a lot more could be said. Again, I mentioned a section on the Holy Spirit. He believes the Holy Spirit directly in a direct way apart from the Word. As he even states in there, leads and guides men today to be able to overcome the unseen evil angels and demons around. Day. And if you have a lot of faith and you engage in prayer, then you can fight against the satanic forces of these invisible evil angels and these demons that are trying to hurt you. But don't try to stop the good angels that are trying to influence you to do good. He goes throughout that book making these kind of wild statements. And we could go through more, but we're out of time. Joe has written, in my opinion, one of the worst books about a Pentecostal leading, nudging, and possession of angels, demons, and the spirit than could be written or probably has been written by and anyone in the brotherhood. I know you got Terry Rush and others who have written their wild books about the Holy Spirit, but I don't think any has come close to about angels and demons that Joe's come, who claims to be a member of the Lord's Church. After reading the blasphemous ways that he views God, Christ, and his Holy Spirit, and the church, and honestly, it made me want to vomit when I finished reading this book. 
I'm glad it's over with. I'll keep it in my library in case it comes up later I need to refer to it. But I'll promise you that it is not my intention unless I start believing like he does and lose my mind that I'll pick this book up and read it again. I'll keep it for reference and maybe to refute some other people who, who do believe in it. But it's not worth reading. It's not worth wasting time or effort or money to buy such a book. I'd say save your money and read your Bible. You'd be a whole lot better off. Look at the, what the Bible really says about it rather than what Beam says about it. I'd pick the Bible over Beam any day. As we close this afternoon, we do want to extend the Lord's invitation. It may be that you're here today and you're not a child of God. If you've never rendered obedience to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Paul states in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God's word that can save your soul. What saves you is the blood of Christ that saves you. But through the word of God, you learn of the blood of Christ. It is through the word of God you learn of Jesus Christ. It is through your study of the word of God that you develop faith. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And as you read and study your Bible, and you have the understanding of who Jesus is, what he's done, you understand his church for which he died, the church of Christ that was founded on, on the day of Pentecost about 2,000 years ago. You can respond to the invitation to put on your Lord in baptism. Because if you truly believe in him, according to Mark 16, 16, you need to be baptized into him to be saved. And upon that belief, though, prior to that baptism, you must repent of your sin. If you're living in sin, you're lost. You're doomed to a devil's hell. That's not what I say. The Bible teaches us this. Luke 13, 3, the Bible says, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Upon your repentance, you can come confessing your faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 10 and verse 10, the Bible says, With a heart man believeth in the righteousness, but with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. And with your mouth you can confess Jesus Christ as the Lord and as the Son of God. And upon your confession, we can immerse you in baptism to reach the blood of Christ. In Romans 6, 3, and 4, paraphrasing those two passages, he tells us we are baptized into his death. And as we're baptized in his death, verse 4, he says, Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also we should walk in newness of life. As you obey the gospel, you can come, as come today to obey it, you can arise out of baptism to walk in newness of life. You can start a life fresh, away from sin and away from Satan. You can change masters, serving Satan in this world and sin to serving Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as you do that and you live a Christian life, being a faithful member of his church, for in Acts 247, by the way, when you are saved, you are added to his church. We're, you're not voted on. We don't cast out uh, marbles, votes, or anything like that to determine. As you obey the gospel of Christ, he adds you to his church. He puts you in his church. And as you remain faithful to him in his church and to the blood for which he, that he shed on Calvary for you, one day heaven will be yours. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1 verse 7, as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. We'll encourage you to do that today. To put your Lord on in baptism. If you've not done that, or if you've done that rather, and you've wandered away, why not come back, return to your first love, over in the book of Revelation chapter 2, we find that the church of Ephesus had left her first love. And as a result, they were told to repent or else the candlestick would be removed. The whole church was told this. It may be that in your own personal life you've left your first love. You've turned away from Jesus Christ and you've gone back into a world of sin. Why not come back today and repent of those sins? Confess them and pray for forgiveness of them. God will forgive you. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you can once again be in the fellowship of the saints and fellowship with God. As you, excuse me, walk a faithful walk and live a Christian life, heaven will be yours one day. There are those who need to respond in any way. We urge you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?